me let oh. me put, get on my booster seat. Yeah, we know about Asians and size and things. <laughs> <you know, like, laughs> going right to the uh, here. All right. Okay. Paul, would you like to introduce this topic? I think this. Yeah, is, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're uh, we're in the Swoley Trinity uh, episode three, and I'm here with my uh, with my Swoley Trinity Brohams, Scott Stevenson and Alan Aragon. Um, as usual, glad glad to be here with you with you guys today. Um, so I want to talk – our topics for today, we actually had two topics that we were going to talk about today, but we kind of settled it. Well, it actually technically is two topics, but they're intertwined with one another. Uh, and the topics that we're going to we're gonna hit on today are, number one, red meat, and the second one would be the carnivore diet. So they kind of tie in with one another. So Alan, you've hit on these in your uh, research review, and um, I have hit on the red meat topic quite a few times and I'm not sure why I, we, we talked about it in the preliminary call this past week and I laughed about it, but I'm not sure why lifters have this kind of emotional attachment to red meat. A lot of lifters have that, this kind of emotional attachment to red meat. And Alan, I think at the time yours was kind of like this, this kind of almost like voodoo ish belief that, you know, whatever I eat is what I become, you know? So like if I'm, if I'm eating chicken and I'm becoming a chicken and it's kind of a lesser source of protein and, if I'm eating uh, like a bison, I'm becoming like a raging animal out in the wilderness, that kind of thing. So there's kind of an ideology that permeates through that type of, of food selection choice. And I don't deny that that's probably the case with all these guys. You know, red meat considered to be manly. You're eating red meat. You're a man. You're grilling outside. Whatever. Anyway, um, but the fact is, and I've hit on this multiple times in multiple posts and had this in, in conversations with people. From a muscle building or strength standpoint, there's there's nothing special about red meat compared to other sources of animal protein. Um, and like I, a lot of people say that uh, you can – one of the things, like one of the, the first day with that is one of the arguments is that red meat today is not as nutritious as it was, say, decades ago, which is, is probably true. I haven't gotten into the agricultural side of things with that. I actually have an article coming out, and you and I had a sidebar about that with, um, with our fruits and vegetables anymore, um, with soil erosion. That's totally a different rabbit hole. But uh, that red meat isn't as nutritious today as it was decades ago, then you circumvent that problem by choosing – Grass fed, which is a, kind of another pet peeve for me, is people getting obsessed with the whole grass fed beef. Not saying like go out and support your local farmer, absolutely 100. percent But it also comes back to there's not this massive difference in nutrient value between the the red meat that you're buying at the store and grass fed beef either. Is or or do you have a counter argument to that? And if you do, hit me. Gee. No, that's. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's perfectly said, Paul. Um, the whole idea of getting grass-fed beef over grain-fed beef uh, comes down to a few micronutrients, and um, the focus, the main focus, was fatty acid content. And so, um, grass-fed beef is generally higher in total fats, and it's also higher in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, as compared to omega-6 fatty acids. And so just population-wide, uh, we here, especially in the West, consume um, a disproportionate amount of omega-6 fatty, ac fatty acids compared to our omega-3 fatty acid intakes. And this leads to a bunch of potentially adverse uh, clinical outcomes. And... Um, the whole idea of, of switching over to grass-fed beef is that you can potentially impact your fatty acid intake to favor better cardiovascular health. But the problem with that idea lies in the sheer amounts of the fatty acids, uh, particularly omega-3 fatty acids within grass-fed beef. So while you can throw out statistics like, oh yeah, um, grass-fed beef – has double the omega-3 content of grain-fed beef or, wh or whatever stat you want to dredge up. Here's the, the facts of the matter. In order to get one gram of omega-3 fat in grass-fed beef, you'd have to consume over 100 grams of fat from the grass-fed beef, okay, for every gram. 
And so you're so much what, better are you, off. Are you trying to apply that using beef as a source of omega threes is not very efficient? Because I feel <laughs> like that's what you just said. Oh, oh, it's it's downright funny. It's hilarious. So, well, so that whole the, the whole argument of grass fed beef ha- hinging upon fatty acid content is just ridiculous you know yeah that's uh, literally the the argument that i made before as like if you are trying to base the argument that you're getting more omega-3s um out of grass-fed beef than you're getting out of grain-fed beef i'm like dude you went very wrong in your nutritional selection somewhere along the way i mean this is this to me this is not difficult um if you if you're needing omega-3s guys where are you getting your omega-3s from and eat any kind of fatty fish uh, green yeah fish, yeah park fish so, so okay, so the other one is, so I get that you get into a lot with the people who are big red meat lovers and think there's something special, is generally a higher source of, like, uh, the, the B vitamin content. The problem is we don't have, we don't see a lot of B vitamin deficiencies across the population. That this doesn't tend to be a, a micro, micronutrient um, deficiency that we see, a, a little bit of B um, any of the, the B vitamins tend to go a pretty long ways um, and are readily accessible in, in a high variety of foods. So it doesn't need to be a problem um, unless you're, say, vegan. Um, and so and then the other one is what is it? Iron. Um, and again, that's one of those where if you yeah, if you're anemic or you have a problem with anemia, then maybe adding in something like beef might be super helpful. Um, but again, if you're getting other sources of animal um animal proteins in your diet, generally you tend to be covered. If you have a deficiency in a micronutrient that you would say is associated with beef, it probably means that you're not eating enough animal protein overall. And I think that would be kind of a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. They try, you know, relying on, on beef. Now this is kind of goes a little bit more into the, you know, the glorification or, or deification of beef intake versus other sources. But um, as far as grass-fed versus grain-fed goes, I wanted to mention a couple other things. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a higher amount of uh, monounsaturated fats in the grain-fed uh, beef compared to grass-fed beef. And so some might point to that as actually being an advantage to grain-fed beef. Um, the <clears throat> grass-fed beef has a higher amount of uh, – believe it or not, in some research shows it has a higher proportion of saturated fat. <laughs> Uh, but it happens to be um, stearic acid, which has shown basically neutral effects on cardiovascular health markers. And so really with, with grain versus grass-fed beef, you're looking at little things that don't matter. That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, so, you know, I, I did this long-ass article on grain versus grass-fed beef in my research review, as you as you know, I, as you've read. And it really just does come down to – Wow, none of this freaking matters. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been saying that for years, and I pissed so many people off. But I spent weeks looking at the data, and it was so it, it, so nuanced and insignificant between the two. I'm like, it really doesn't matter, guys. Just buy your beef where you want to. And if you and I hear people say stuff like, "Well, um, grass fed beef tastes better." Um, generally, now I know that taste is essentially uh, kind of an opinion and, and, and highly individualistic, but generally speaking. Um, just fattier cuts of meat, meat overall tend to be more tasty. And that's probably, there's probably some evolutionary concept related to that with the fact that they're, they're more calorie dense, um, and more marbled, uh, fatty marbled beef tend to, I mean, um, when you go to restaurants, you don't tend to find a lot of flank steak. You fin- tend to find a lot of ribeyes and T-bones. Um, and there's a reason why for that. People tend to like the taste of those better because they're, they're, uh, they're more delicious. And, and then I get people who say, well, that grass fed or grain fed, the grass fed tastes better. I've, I've eaten lots of both. I don't notice any taste difference between the two. A lot of that could literally just be kind of like placebo. They like buying grass fed beef. They believe it's better for them. So in their mind, it tastes better. You guys, like, we're going to have to do one talking about all the different various studies on placebo effect one day. And I think that's probably a lot of what, what that is. Now, somebody really believes, like, I can't, con- Somebody says grass fed tastes better to me. There's no way I can prove that's a lie. Okay. I cannot prove that's a lie. Um, I just think for me, I didn't notice the taste. I know that I knew that I was paying four times as much for the grass fed beef uh, that I was compared to grain fed. Um, so to me, it actually. 
actually tasted worse. <laughs> just you know that that whole thing that talk- you brought you brought about. Uh, oh, Scott's coming in, but he's cutting wow, out. So say something. So yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's frozen right now. So um, yeah. um, remember what oh, you're going to say, so Scott. Okay. Can you can you hear Scott? Can you hear him right now, Paul? No, he's breaking up. He's breaking up. Okay, I'm going to come in then. I'm going to come in. <laughs> um, <laughs> remember what you're going to say, Scott. Um, so the thing that you brought up earlier, Paul, about red meat having this almost this romantic image of being the the thing that that people visualize. You picture this red mass of muscle that just sort of uh, transfers through osmosis like yeah, onto your own right, body. Your you know? own body, right. Yeah, people imagine um, uh, Milo carrying that that uh, that beast, you know, yep. every day of its life, and then it's it's freaking tremendous and whatnot. Uh, I, I, I think that plays such a huge role in in the sort of this romanticized idea in the bodybuilding community of how they look at red meat compared to chicken or compared to fish. And um, there are some other things that Scott mentioned in, in our in our off the record discussion about little things that that people might focus on, like, OK, well, greater, you know, that the CLA content of beef, the creatine content of beef, those sort of things. Well, First of all, the, the, the creatine content of beef, you would have to eat a pound of beef in order to get roughly a gram of creatine. Okay, so um, – or rather – you know what? I've seen as high as two grams of, of creatine per it, pound it's, of beef. Yeah, it's give or take. So you're looking at either way. That it's something between, between the tune of 30 to 40 ounces of beef. To get five grams of creatine. Five grams, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So let, let's do this and louder for the people in the back. 2.2, a kilo of chicken has how many grams of creatine in it? Can you guys want to guess? About five. About five grams of creatine. So the bullshit that gets, is, is being pushed forward about beef having cre- so much more creatine is literally – I don't even know where that comes from, and I do see it perpetuated – is that if you actually look across all animal proteins, the amount of creatine content is really close to the same across all animal proteins for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, that, that's an interesting fact. And just the whole idea of, all right, getting – okay, let, let's imagine somebody eats two pounds of, of meat or 2.2 pounds of meat a day and they get their five grams of creatine a day. Okay, great. <laughs> fine. Fine. You know. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you look at the, the research in total – there are some guys who benefit from 10 grams of creatine. What are you going to do? Like have, feed those guys five pounds of meat? <laughs> it gets expensive, right? Right. So, so, um, and the whole that might have that, some caloric issues or you know, gastrointestinal issues as well. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. And if you buy your beef like grass fed, let's say, then you're going to extinguish all your savings inside of a month. <laughs> so, um, and, and then there's CLA and, and really, uh, what are we trying to get out of CLA? It's not this magic fatty acid that um, automatically extends your life or improves your health. Uh, there, there is some wonky research showing that it might help with body composition, but the long-term research on CLA, and there's a specific uh, review paper on this, just looking at the long-term effects of CLA on body composition, it basically withers into nothing you know, over the long term. So you got a, a bunch of short-term studies showing CLA does something, but in the long term, nope, that effect disappears. So, yeah, um, there there was some other stuff that you mentioned, me Scott. Can you hear me? Am I, am I uh, available now? There, there you go. That's a little better. Okay, okay, good. So, gosh, let me see if I can remember. What I wanted to say, one thing about taste and the meat is there, there were years – probably, I want to say seven or eight years when I lived in Arizona, where I got, I, I would buy a hundred pounds a month and disseminate it to some of my friends from a guy in Arizona who was actually it was called the Jojoba Beef Company. If anyone's near Tucson, they can find Greg Vinson. And he had these Africanized cattle that fed on jojoba bean as one of their main sort of foliage. And it gave uh. the beef a wonderful flavor. He actually could pick out some really lean cuts for me, like literally he would just visualize it looking at the, the fat content. You could see when you cooked it. It was very, very lean. We obviously can tell by the residual fat left in the pan or as it's cooking up. Uh, so that's one thing I think that, you know, when you go and you choose whether you're going to buy it in the store, where if you look at any of the documentaries looking at our agricultural um, 
uh, industry, it's just horrible what happens to cattle. It's not a very pretty picture there. Whereas these cattle, for instance, yeah, these cattle that Greg had, they lived to be about 10 years old on average. And he just had enough of them, but he could sacrifice them. And in a, in a, it was a very humane way. They had a full life. And um, so it was a very humane nature of beef. Um, Bryce. Paul, can you hear? Can you hear Scott? He's 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 breaking up a lot. Uh, he's and his video is getting stuck. I can't hear him, bro. He's stuck in in the muck. <laughs> yeah, that's that's catch that's uh, Murphy's law here. Let me give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear what I'm saying. Did you guys? I, I can right now. Did you guys tell everybody why Scott's video is scurry right now? Where so Scott's at? Scott's at the airport today, but he's taking one for the I'm team to, to be. Yeah, to be here. So it's it's um, mm-hmm. uh, and he was he was clear earlier, but I like we'll have to deal with it. So what what you were saying, Scott, is and I think what you're getting at is um, that if you can find a local farmer that does his his uh, kind of beef, beef agriculture or a specific way then you can find a more flav- flavorful uh, flavorful kind of meat to choose from that's kind of like you like personally right yeah so that's one thing that can attract there um, the other thing that I that I tossed out when we were chatting about this earlier in the week was trying to figure out why it is that people would think there's this magical mystical characteristic to red meat and I'm a ma- I imagine like in the day when bodybuilders were dieting down um, either the dieting down or the trying to gain weight and they simply put the meat in place for just chicken let's say made that sort of a, a wholesale stand at least from one piece of research and maybe Alan knows some other yeah, the brain's lab just get too low I can't fucking hear what he's saying. (laughs) (laughs) Scott, you have to to be like very sushant with your uh, your speaking today because I think you're just going to get little blurbs. (laughs) You have to speak in exact spurts when... when Just little spurts when your Wi-Fi is working perfectly. That's true. of extra calories and it makes the meat taste better a lot of times. So those were the three points. That's yeah. the you know, <laughs> it just turned back up. Those are three points. Uh, oh, okay. okay. So yeah. I, I have, I kind of have a recollection. Okay. Scott, we couldn't hear what on earth you said, but thankfully we, we talked about this earlier. And if, if my recollection is, is correct here, um, when bodybuilders are, are dieting down, for a show, uh, there'll be this tendency to um, swap out protein sources for the leanest sources possible, mm-hmm. and what that can end up doing is <clears throat> messing with androgen levels, lowering them down, um, generally making people feel like crap. And so, um, when people have uh, dieted down with with beef, there tended to be at least some proportion of, of fat within the meat and in a, a significant amount greater than um, if they were to do like chicken breast or lean fish. And then, um, you know, they, they actually got to feel better and potentially get better effects because uh, test levels don't plummet that much. Um, I know that we, we talked about that and – I'm wondering if there's something else that I'm not remembering that you brought no, up. No, I, I, I think that was that was that was right on point. Um, yeah, with what we talked about last week was that uh, when somebody's in a severe hypocaloric state, they're dieting really hard. Uh, they removed most of the fat uh, from their diet, and then they introduced some steaks and red meat. At one point, they get some of that saturated fat back in. Um, that has a direct effect on horm- hormonal levels, which it can kind of make you feel a little bit better. Um, like post eating it, maybe you're able to train a little harder. Maybe your mental acuity rises just a little bit. Um, and I think that there was some basically kind of those indirect correlations or even direct correlations associated with that. <laughs> <laughs> Better test levels when dieting. 
uh, fat for ketogenesis, uh, uh, fat for calories, for offseason, and for, for growth, <laughs> for growth. <laughs> Tiny gains, tiny gains. Oh, the, that, oh man! Just, just for the listener here who's not seeing the visual, Scott just held up his notes on his phone up to the screen so we could read it. Since we can't hear him, he's at the airport. Yeah, he's at the um, airport. He's here with us. It's like having a yeah. It's like I say, it's like having a deaf guy on the podcast with us. It's, it's, it's like talk. having Bernie. It's like weekend with Bernie. Yeah. Um, so 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 yeah. here's the, so just right out of the gate. Um, typically, if you have if you're if you're in an isocaloric state, or if you're in a calorie surplus, and you, you're eating a sufficient amount of animal proteins, there's really nothing about having red meat um, that is super beneficial compared to eating chicken, uh, whole eggs, um, fish, turkey, uh, any, any of that. Basically, you're going to be covered pretty well. There's nothing for swapping those out and making sure you're having red meat. There's red meat might taste better to you, but there's nothing physiologically. So, that's going to happen that makes red meat superior to all those other animal protein sources. Is, is that I, kind of, I want to mention this part too, guys. It's like uh, beef yeah, just from your personal experience. And, and certainly from mine, I found that beef is, is quite a bit more satiating than uh, other protein sources. And so um, I'm not sure if you've experienced beef at least seeming to hold hunger at bay, Better than like chicken or lean chicken or other other lean sources, but like whey, for example, um, I've found that beef is a bit more satiating. Well, what what have your experiences been with that? Now that's this is a great discussion, Alan, because this is that law of individuality coming back into play. I find the opposite. I can eat beef and I can I'm I'm starving thirty minutes later, but if I eat tuna, I am satiated for a very long time. Really? Yeah, of all things. Sheesh, okay. Tuna. Of all okay. things tuna. So, you know, that comes back to something we talked about, like with the keto diet, you brought up your buddy who did keto for a month, and then basically the satiety, high satiating effects went away after like a month of being keto, right? Like, mm-hmm. in other words, yeah. that particular, that data, that law, Scott says, fast, slow digestion, better nighttime protein. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There, That's a really good point, right? Um, so for a lot of like that comes up a lot, like cottage cheese or a casein protein at night. Um, but you could yeah. substitute that out for the whole point is to have something that's slow digesting, get into the digestive tract very slowly at night. So you got that slow, long release of amino acids into the bloodstream. Yeah. So, and, be, and beef is a slow digesting protein to begin with. So if you have beef that's a little bit on the fattier side, then you're definitely going to get that nighttime slow release. And so that, that's, that's actually, a whole other topic. though. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, though. So if you're if you're dieting, if you're dieting really hard and you're working your macros correctly and you're feeling shitty and sleep sucked, um, you could move beef into a higher fattier cut of beef, of red meat to your, say, your nighttime meal. It might help you sleep better. Um, and that also make you feel better hormonally. So, and that would be from the fat. So I guess if you were to say from that standpoint, but that's totally the kind of the opposite of the way, uh, meat, red meat gets perpetuated as having some type of special muscle growing, uh, properties as far as its nutritional makeup, which just, I have never found it. I asked the question last week of the preliminary clock, have they ever run, have they ever run a study looking at this? And you laughed and you said, no, dude, because like they, we, like there's no reason to. Yeah, you know, the, I don't remember how you phrased it, but it was actually funny at the time. Well, there, you know, there's actually there's one study that compared post workout beef with post workout chicken with <laughs> post workout whey, <clears throat> and I, I think it was to the order of like 40 ish grams or something like that, typical dose. And they didn't find any differences in the improvements in uh, body composition over time. So all, all three groups. Gained muscle and, and strength and all, all of that, and there were no yeah, differences in body red, content. Red meat did not shoot muscle protein synthesis like straight through the thing. What Scott said, a biological value, PDC, AAS, um, mm-hmm. et cetera, about the same for all meats and for proteins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Th- this is this is one of the funniest episodes possible, you guys. If you <laughs> just, could see, just, if the listeners could see. Just, just because wow. it's really, it's really great. It's really great, right? Scott's just writing down his, his talking points. Okay. <laughs> So I, I think we've kind of established like the high level overview from that takeaway for the listeners, for the people who are watching. Uh, high level overview: if you like red meat, like eat red meat, that's that's cool. 
We could get into the whole side argument of the amount of evidence that we have against saturated fat. However, we kind of also know now that saturated fat is not a big deal, most likely as we kind of once made it out to be. It's more along the lines of just be mindful of it so you're not just pounding saturated fat down your face on the daily. Yeah, 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 Uh, that's right. And, and, you know, there's a tangent here that I have to have to pull you guys into <clears throat> the whole idea of bodybuilders having red meat in the off season and then, bam, switch over to, to, to fish. OK, so Alan, OK, so Alan, it's really weird that you bring that up because when I really start dieting hard, when I, I've done, I did this, I actually even did this um, when I uh, for my last show was I matched macros. And removed red meat, and my my fat loss, it was so much better. Mm. It was so much better. Now, that what's weird is over the decades, you've heard that kind of anecdotally from bodybuilders, right? Like mm-hmm. we swap out red meat for leaner cuts. I actually intentionally matched the macros. Ever see a fish with thick skin? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You know, here's the interesting. Here's the, the interesting thing too. Thibodeau, Christian Thibodeau, he did a photo shoot. He said he had to do the same thing. He had to, he swapped out his red meat, matched the macros, speeded up his fat loss. Now I'm not. We don't. I don't, we don't have any studies looking at this. I'm just saying anecdotally. When I take red meat out, it doesn't macro, matter if my macros are the same. I do notice I lean up way faster. Well, it's interesting with, with you. Red meat doesn't satiate you personally very much compared to the other protein sources. No. So <clears throat> I think that if you were to look at things individually, then that would be the protocol for you. And what – you know, the, sort of the take-home would be for people to experiment and see how they personally respond to different protocols because I don't think you can issue a blanket or a universal recommendation for which protein source is going to work best for – a given individual or or a given group of individuals, you know? So the whole idea of, okay, beef, great for the off season, you know, it gives you size, gives you fullness, and then you switch it out for fish and then you thin the skin towards pre-contest. Um, you know, there, there, there may be something to that for certain individuals. Did you match fats, fatty acids, Paul? Maybe it was a essential fatty acid issue. I replaced all the, I replaced the fats out, um, from the beef that I was having at the time, uh, with fats that were coming in from walnuts, uh, extra virgin olive oil, and I believe it was coconut butter. So I was pretty good. And you were freaking peeled. Mm-hmm. You, you don't you don't wave those shots around very much, man. But yeah. I can attest. Yeah, yeah. I can attest, I, man. I I just for me personally, I noticed when I took the beef out, something in my body composition changed. That my my fat that my fat loss was it was faster and again super fast growth science whatever I don't know I don't have an answer for it it honestly doesn't make sense because we all agree on the law of thermodynamics so there really should have been a difference but I've talked with enough guys that do the same thing they they pull beef out and they do notice when they replace it with really leaner cuts of protein they get leaner faster well Jay Cutler did it Phil Heath did it. Yeah, uh, I know. Phil takes a lot of shit for his whole tilapia thins the skin, <laughs> right? Right. He's taking a bunch of shit for a uh, slight incline. Um, uh, what is it? Treadmill walks, cutting up the glutes. Right. Oh, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. It's awesome. Oh, I don't want to get off of talking shit on Phil Heath. We're gonna be, we're gonna be in his gym. It's not only that. It's like Phil. We got, we got to be nice to him until then. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just, I'll just talk shit to his face when we see him or whatever. Nice. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, for serious, like I do notice that anecdotally um, that I I tend to I tend to lean out way faster once I, I remove red meat, even if I'm watching my portions of macros really intensely. When I'm trying to lean out, I am. Scott, have you noticed anything similar at all? Do you respond? Your does your fat loss respond better to certain kind of food selections more than others, or have you noticed anything anecdotally like that? Um, hopefully, can you guys hear me here? When I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. great. I was typing all sorts of things out. Uh, one of the things when – this was maybe decades ago when people first started realizing how healthy fish oil can be and fatty acids could be is that I kept hearing a lot of anecdotal reports of guys who've been doing the chicken and rice thing um, and dieting in various ways just like trying to eat clean chicken and rice. And then they started supplementing with fish oil. And, of course, bodybuilders, when they supplement, they, you know, they get the max dose and then some. And guys were having sort of a recomping type of scenario um, over the course of months where they were adding muscle mass unexpectedly in a way that 
that they could attribute to really anything else. This is not the first time I've heard this. You've heard this, yeah. So, I mean, and that's probably maybe someone who is deficient. Um, There's some interesting animals where they fed them EFAs, omega-3s, and um, increased membrane salinity. All sorts of effects on how receptors and things that are membrane bound can interact with incoming hormones and cytokines, et cetera, et cetera. And if you feed enough to mice or rats, you can actually create a membrane fluidity issue in the mitochondria that causes uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, mm-hmm. sort of in the same way that DMP or um, ustinic acid or something like that would do. So that could have sort of a, an effect too. Obviously, that's going to impact your body composition, as we know, you know DMP can do. So someone who hasn't been eating any fish oil, eating it, like just avoiding fats, or just not eating salmon, and they go and they do that, that, that can happen. I was never one to avoid that, so I, ha- I didn't experience that personally. Um, so, but uh, that's the thing that I've I've heard the most of, as far as anecdotes go. Yeah, there's some there's some strange little anecdotal stories about this kind of stuff all over the place, depending on who you talk to. That doesn't always have research to back it. But Al, I remember even a couple of years ago, you and I had a sidebar conversation about uh, with guys I work with for Peak Week, and it's like. Sometimes you have to figure out what carb sources a, a guy can use that he can actually carb up effectively on, and it's different for each person. Like, I could never – I used to laugh at guys talking about carving up on oatmeal. I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, I could eat oatmeal the entire day, and I would be flat as a board. Like, it didn't matter how many grams of carbs I was getting from oatmeal. I just would not fill out on it. Yeah, it's it's really – I mean, that whole individual response thing is huge. I, I've known guys, like, for example, Alberto Nunez um, – who he's, he's famous for not necessarily the size that he gains, but for the shreddedness. And his preferred choice is is corn tortillas. I mean, it could be a Latino thing too, but I mean, <laughs> he he just loads up on corn tortillas. And and um, uh, other guys they love sweet potatoes. There's there's a whole freaking sweet potato cult. I'll tell you what, man. If I eat more than two sweet potatoes in a sitting, I'm freaking trumpeting myself up to the moon. You know, it just I just can't digest uh, sweet potatoes very well. Yeah, and I could digest sweet potatoes, but the same thing. Like I, I could eat them all day long, but I'm going to be flat as a board. They do nothing as far mm. as filling me out. You know, a, a lot of people. I, I'd say that the the carb source that a lot of people agree with as far as digestive uh, agreement or comfort goes is white rice. Um, I've seen, uh, I've dealt with a lot of, of competitors who will attest to the digestibility of white rice. So, I don't know. Yeah, there's an interesting um, study, I'm forgetting the first author right now, where they, where they compared glycemic responses to um, maltodextrin and white bread. So the two things, or maybe it was put in glucose and white bread, the two things that are so much used for different indices tables and they plotted like I think 15 or maybe 20 different individual subjects glucose curves they were all over the place they weren't perfect you know upside down U's Mm -hmm. Um, some of them you know had sort of slopes to them look like roller coasters in some cases the the white bread was higher than the 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 glucose source Um, and some was the other way around all over the place and that's basically what we're talking about is is yeah, whatever we give you the timeout signal, just finish typing on your phone <laughs> your connection is getting messed up. Okay, so now we're talking about carb sources, which is kind of a nice segue into um, the second part uh, of the podcast, and that is we're going to cover the carnivore diet. So, which is basically where, you know, you're eating just eating just meat. For anybody who's unfamiliar with the carnivore diet, the carnivore diet essentially, high-level overview it is essentially you just eat meat and you only eat meat. Um, and um, the kind of the, the ideology there is that eating the animal from head to tail will provide you with pretty much all of the, your the nutritional needs that you have in your life. Would, do you guys think I'm kind of encapsulating that correctly? Yeah, that was a claim. That's a claim that that's made. Yep. 
yep, if you eat nose to tail, then you'll get all your essential nutrients, etc. Blah blah blah, and all that stuff. But uh, in you know, if yeah. you if you make that a population wide recommendation, you're going to see people um, deficient in in vitamin C. You're going to see people mm-hmm. deficient <laughs> in. Can in you various- tell me what animal is providing me a tremendous amount of vitamin C? <laughs> yeah, just- not. Yeah, not not. Not many, none. <laughs> There'd be zero. <laughs> <laughs> right. The answer to so, that question is zero. Right, right. And, and it's, it's interesting the way that the carnivore guys justify this stuff. They say, yeah, if you eat carnivore long enough, it lowers your need for, for vitamin C. I, I feel like that scurvy existed at one time and they would disagree <laughs> with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the more savvy carnivore guys are like, yeah, I like to do carnivore with some citrus fruits to make it okay. It's like, all right, well then you're no longer carnivore if you're so meat. Car- like, like what, what I understand, carnivore in its truest form is literally you're just eating meat, and nothing else, right? Is that not what it is? That's it. That's okay. It. Okay. So let's. Uh... So. No, you're still you're still blocking, Scott. So type, type. Um, okay, so Alan, you you actually kind of addressed this, and I wish I really wish Scott's connection was working today because all of us ended up on the same exact same page pretty much. Yeah. Um, after we really kind of dug into this, like I went down the, the deep rabbit holes with the carnivore stuff, and when I went through your review where you addressed it, you literally came to all the same conclusions. I mean, Scott did, and I don't want people to feel like that we're ganging up on carnivore. So I actually want to lead and talk about some of the what's Scott saying. Uh, eggs, bone, tendons, etc. Also part of the okay. So eggs, bone, and tendons. Um, I'm, yeah, and I would consider that. I would have considered that the eggs, uh, and then you're eating also. I mean, I, who doesn't eat the bone when you get a t t bone steak, right? <laughs> like who doesn't? Like I I gnaw on that thing the whole time at dinner. That's that's a, that's what I look forward to. Uh, so. Uh, Somebody's going to make a joke, joke about me, like, gnawing on bones or putting bones in my mouth. That's fine. Um, I beat them to it. So uh, I want to talk about, before we do, anybody watches it and go, oh, it's just slamming the cardboard. There's, clearly, there's some benefits. There's yeah, the, some clear yeah. benefits. And, Alan, go ahead and, like, hit on because pretty much right. we all agreed the same thing on the, the – there's absolutely some benefits to the carnivore diet. So, listen, I, I want to make sure anytime that we address these – Subjects that people feel like we're being fair and we just don't show up, you know, play kick the puppy with some topic. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, let's talk to me about, like, the benefits that someone would see by doing an all meat based diet. Okay, A case can be made. Well, okay, well, even backing up before that, um, the people who gravitate towards the carnivore diet are people who are having issues, just clinical presentations of, uh, of difficulties with digesting food, with responding to various foods. And um, a lot of the times it comes down to it comes down to certain plant foods that will be the uh, offending agents. And so um, these folks, they try everything and then it, they kind of eliminate it down to, well, it's got to be one of one of these these vegetables or one of these plant based foods that I'm consuming that's messing with me and causing X Y or Z adverse effect. And so so just to be clear, the people who gravitate towards carnivore are people who are having pre existing health issues with whatever. The, <laughs> that's is that going on in the airport? Yeah, there? I like how uh, Scott can't get a word in, but the person over the intercom can just shout right over. <laughs> so 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 the a person who's having pre existing conditions that can they could use the carnivore for like an elimination diet to kind of narrow down, okay, I'm having here's let me take everything out except meat and I'm gonna have fat and protein coming in and then I'll slowly inter- reintroduce food later back on to see to see what I can digest effectively uh, and yeah. assimilate effectively, um, mm-hmm. if that's what they want to do. But I, I think that there's also kind of the the um the suggestion that carnivore can be uh, sustained, but it's isn't it kind of relatively new to kind of make that assertion? Yeah, dude. Um, it's it's look within the whole human evolutionary timeline. Yeah. 
there have never been populations that just strictly avoided plant foods. No. And, uh, but that's, hold up, I don't don't want us to get to beating on them too soon. That's kind of a thing that they, they kind of, they don't say outright, but they do hint at, right? Like, in other words, like, I, they kind of waver back and forth when I've gone through kind of like some of the information that's out there is that our ancestors ate this way, but there's, there, you're right. There's no, there's no ancient group of people that had a solely nothing but meat based, meat based diet. Right. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the way it was before is what was optimal. It's just that the human species is amazingly adaptable and resilient at surviving and even thriving on anything you throw at it. So uh, the, the, the example of, of meat only and what the benefits might be towards that end, like you mentioned, number one, for elimination diets and systematically investigating what could be the possible offending foods that are messing you up or messing with you, um, I don't see it being – completely unjustifiable or unreasonable to start off with a plant-free base and then systematically add the plant foods that you like in order to see objectively which one of those agents might be doing the damage or or might be messing with you. I think that's a legitimate um, protocol. Now, uh, here's the other thing. The other group of people that gravitate towards the carnivore diet – are people who have previously been on the standard American diet or the SAD, as it were, the SAD diet, which is basically filled with a lot of crap. So if you were to take carnivore versus a diet that's loaded with refined foods, refined flour foods, sugar, and various types of fats mixed in and just a bunch of crap, well, then maybe the lesser of the two evils would be the carnivore diet, which has which is more satiating, has more protein, and is potentially more dense in terms of essential and uh, essential micronutrition and and macronutrition. So you're looking at if I were to tie all this together, I would say, look, the carnivore diet can be beneficial, but that's very relative to what you're comparing it to. So. Yeah, and I think, Scott, did you have something to show? Did you just want to stuff your face, or did you have something you typed on your phone that you just want to show the camera? Mm. I bet you we can hear him now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. one of the things I now? think yeah. – Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My, uh, you know, I wanted to just throw out my biggest issues because one of the things that has happened, I think, in a lot of the discussions about the carnivore diet is – it from an evolutionary or a health perspective, but we're talking here to mainly to bodybuilders or people who are strength and power athletes. And the biggest issues for me really comes down to the same things you would run into with a ketogenic diet to a certain degree is are you going to have enough fuel for high energy contractions to train your ass off in the gym? Is that going to possibly happen without any carbohydrates? And if you're trying to gain weight, you're going to try to do it with meat only. Um, are you going to be able to get the calories in, or are you going to have a digestive conundrum and an appetite issue along the way? Yeah, and that and that ties into actually one of the benefits that that I saw. It's like somebody there would be almost an unintentional uh, caloric restriction on this kind of particular diet because of the high degree of satiation that's going to be coming from eating that much protein each day. So for a lot of people who see fat loss and Wow, I wouldn't even get into the, the kind of podcast we all watch, but there's the the they almost some of the stories almost like want you to defy the belief in the law of thermodynamics. But what happens is I think if you're eating meat all day, you should see a high degree of satiation happening and you should see that kind of unintentional caloric restriction happening each day, which means that's going to facilitate fat loss. It's not because that eating um, reduce like taking out what lab we touched on this before in the satiety index. This, the top of the satiety index is actually filled up with a lot of carbohydrate, carbohydrate foods. I always go back to that. I'm like, if you're having trouble with satiety, put throw in some boiled white potatoes into your diet, and you're going to be probably be pretty okay. Um, that I mean, that pretty much uh, that that is the food that I think is at the very top of the satiety index. But if you mix that in with protein, well, people don't call it meat and potatoes or nothing, right? 
It's like the sticks right. to your six to your ribs. So, uh, so the the unintentional um, caloric restriction that kind of happens uh, by just picking animal proteins to eat all day, I think, is the byproduct that it is the fat loss due to the high degree of, of satiation. And the fact is that eating a mega shit ton of calories each day through protein sources alone, your body, I think, would eventually revolt through some digestive issues if you were trying to push that. Scott, I think that's kind of what you were getting at right there, is that the, mm-hmm. there could be some digestive issues. Uh, and, and what well, Alan was saying was... There's one guy, there's actually one... <laughs> ...against John McKetty. <laughs> You'll have to write that down, Scott. Yeah, you have to write that down. Um, the other yeah, one is- it's almost impossible to, to do a carnivore diet, and for most of the people who get on it to to not be in ketosis most of the time. Well, that the only thing about that is, Alan, is like like one of the interviews we watched. They Trey said, "I want to make a distinction that this is not a ketogenic diet." Well, you can say it's not a ketogenic diet, but it's pretty, pretty damn impossible just to eat animal proteins. And, and just animal proteins all day and not be in ketosis, right? I mean, it's going to be pretty right. difficult to pull off. I mean, most of the people on the carnivore diet are not eating lean meat all day. They're going to have to mix in some fatty meats, some fats, and, and all that stuff in order to in order to survive just from a palatability standpoint and from a, the standpoint of, uh, you know, the, just the way you feel on a very low, low-fat, high-protein diet versus a, a diet that's more mixed in terms of uh, – in terms of fat and protein, and most of the guys who I've talked to on the carnivore diet, they prefer fatty meats rather than um, lean meats. They just like it better. Of course, it's, yeah, of course. And and so it's it's just tough to not be ketogenic when you're on the carnivore diet. There are some people who can pull it off, but that is going to suppress appetite all day. And that is one of the appealing things about the carnivore diet to people who switch over to it because suddenly they're eating more protein and suddenly they're more satiated through the day. And then suddenly they're eating less overall calories through the course of the day. And they see fat loss and they look, oh, yeah. they, they look better. So they psychologically, they when you look better, you feel better. So those are all fantastic and wonderful benefits. Yeah. Um, so like I, I and I like where we're headed with this because I, I didn't want people to come across like it's like a some a big, you know, it's like an attack. Um, I, I want to make sure that we're trying to be as fair as possible. Um, the other one was uh, and is that it can change your your uh, uh, the gut microbiota. Um, that doesn't take very long. It can happen 48, was it 48 to 72 hours, I believe, um, with a change in diet. I mean, we've seen that, but we don't know a shit ton really about gut microbiota um, as far as there's there's a lot of theories that it's possibly connected in with depression um, the, through the bidirectional highway that kind of your brain and gut operate on. Um, so there's theories that changing your, your gut microbiota may either alleviate symptoms of, of depression or that certain diets can actually potentially cause greater sy- symptoms of depression. But uh, we again, when people start saying things like that, I become weird because um, it's not there's no uh, the, we don't know a cause and effect and um, the causation of it. It's so it's such a new area that we're looking into. So when people start essentially saying stuff like, well, we removed all the carbohydrates from somebody's diet and put them on an all meat diet or a ketogenic diet, you know, it could be anything from reducing inflammation, which would be another benefit. Um, we don't like I said, we don't. There's so many things as far as like when you're talking about dealing with depression, I think it's kind of it's a little bit irresponsible to say. This is this is this diet, you know, is going to is going to alleviate your depression. You know, I don't think that's a responsible statement to make. And I've heard those statatements and I'm like, that's that's you're, when you're talking about depression. It's a very serious topic. And if you're going to make the claim, if you're going to make the claim that um, something like the carnivore diet could alleviate depression or fix depression, you better come hard to the pain with some meta analysis about that shit, because that's not some things that's not something to say and, and trivialize it. Yeah, agreed, man. Not on my end. Oh boy, no, Scott, you're. I hate that right. Scott's and, not in on this convo. Yeah, yeah, and, and just for the, the listeners, who, just, just so you guys know, Scott is at the airport and he's taking one for the team, and yeah. uh, 
we're doing the best we can with this, but hey, you know, Scott is just such an international star. It's not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> he's waiting on his private. He's waiting on his private jet. Um, okay, so let's get into like we've kind of covered it, and I think that's not bad. In other words, we're saying, hey, if you have some gut, some serious gut problems, uh, anything from consistent uh, constipation or even diarrhea, um, the carnivore diet could be a very good elimination diet for you to experiment with for a while um, to help fix those problems. Um, you know, if you have problems with uh, significant inflammation, it's not a bad diet that you could look into and using for a while. So once again, potentially take out some pro-inflammatory foods that you may not be aware of um, and, uh, and just bring th- things down to the to bare bones level. Um, you know, in other words, this, this compounding issue of, of removing anything that's pro-inflammatory, but also getting into a state of ketosis and they can say it's not a ketogenic all day. Fine. If you wanted to label it, not a ketogenic diet, but your ass is probably going to be in ketosis on the carnivore diet. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's going to be difficult to avoid not being in ketosis. I like how Scott looks like he just got shot like a scene out of collateral. <laughs> he slumped over. Yeah. Vincent just walked in the airport and just smoked him. All right. So, um, so now let's get into some of the stuff and I gotta be honest here. Like, this is now we're getting into the, like, okay, we're gonna, we're, I'm not saying we're taking shots. I want us to be factual, but some of the shit drives me nuts because there is a overarching theme to ignore mountains and mountains of data and meta analysis that absolutely consistently prove the same thing over and over again, where that is ignored by the proponents of the carnivore diet at the same time where they latch on to these studies that are performed on very tiny segments of the population that may have specific problems and kind of use that as their launching pad for benefits. Dude, I am not okay with that. Like that's not cool. Okay. So let's, yeah, you touched on this pretty greatly in your AARR. And like I said, that was the exact place that me and Scott ended up with kind of our, our pet problem, our pet peeve with it. So let's touch on the belief, uh, that, um, kind of goes on by them that fruits and vegetables are a problem because bro, bro. <laughs> uh, okay. So fruits and, um, veg- fruits and vegetables are bad for you. Let's hit this. Let's get on it. Okay. Uh, a lot of this, well, some, at least some of it, um, you know, we, we just watched, uh, Lane Norton, Debate Paul Saladino, I believe. Is that Alan, his name? Alan, Sal- Alan, mess with your now. Scott can't talk and nobody can see you. It's such Ooh. a weird day. <laughs> okay, can you see me now? Can you hear me? No. Watch, we're going to be able to hear Scott in a minute, and now we're going to be able to see you. Alan, you look like. Okay, let, let, let me know if you can hear me. Can you hear me and I see me? I can hear you great, but I can't, like, you're all fuzzy again. But that's okay. Go ahead. Ah, uh, okay. Try, try. Are we back? Am I back online? No. How do you not have your Skype up so you can see yourself? No, I I can see myself fine. Okay. You're like you're can super you, can, fuzzy. No, just keep talking though. Like the information is there. Okay, so uh, you can hear me. You can hear me good. Mhm. Yeah, I can hear you okay. great. Okay. Um Yeah, we we watched the debate between Paul Saladino, if I have his last name right. Yes, I think that's right. And I can't help but point out how ironic it is for the guy has literally the word salad in his last name. <laughs> <laughs> his freaking salad, but he looks like but salad. No, salad. No. Oh god, that's even better! Holy crap! Salad. Salad. No. Salad. No. Salad. No. So yeah, it, it's ironic, and so one of his points of argumentation is. Painting out vegetables and fruits or plant foods as a whole to actually be detrimental, and he he points out a bunch of uh, different reasons that sound good on paper, sound fine. You know, I'll, I'll, if I can recall a couple of them, um, plants have a bunch of compounds and a bunch of toxins and a bunch of protective factors that they have evolved. To have in order to survive the uh, the predation by animals and etc. Because you know plants just sit there, so they need to evolve uh, 
various various uh, poisons, uh, thorns, etc., and various inedible aspects about them in order to protect themselves from being consumed by animals. And so, um, therefore, we as humans eating plants are going to subject ourselves to these plant toxins that could be bad for our health. Okay, so that's one of them. The other one is... Um, Let's make sure to come they, they, back to that because that's important. Yeah, yeah. The other one... They, they went off. Paul Saladino just went off for about an hour on fiber and, and it's, <laughs> you know, on the on the evils of, of fiber. And, and at best, it's unnecessary, but it's probably, you know, going to be detrimental and all this stuff. OK, so and like you were saying, Paul, it's like all of this stuff. OK, cool. That sounds great on paper. Uh, it, it makes some kind of logical sense at some level. But then what does the evidence say? And why aren't vegetarians as a group just living the shortest lives possible and the least healthy people on the planet with the greatest amount of chronic disease and degenerative diseases if, in fact, plant intake is this detrimental? And then, the you know, the, the sort of pre-cooked answer to that challenge is, well, uh, there's healthy user bias. Oh, and, that drove me nuts. <laughs> healthy user bias. And what, what, what that means is that they're supposedly failing to account for the surrounding variables that uh, vegetarians and vegans have in their lifestyle that are compensating for the treachery of their plant intake, right? <laughs> Good freaking grief, you guys. I mean, come on. All right, go ahead, Paul. It was, it was like the meta-analysis, I believe it spanned 10 countries. It was more than, it was hundreds of studies in the meta-analysis. And the common denominator across the meta-analysis was that people who make sure to include fruits and vegetables in their diet on the regular tend to have lower mortality rates. It, it shows this across every study we've ever seen since the history of studies. Okay, there's <laughs> not a study that doesn't show this, right? Yeah, finding, okay. finding health, finding detrimental health effects in the literature looking at plant food intake is like finding a freaking diamond in a snowstorm. Okay, yeah. uh, it's tr it's like finding a snowflake in hell. So, um, and not only that, bro, we you. There are different parameters that are looked at, different outcomes as well. So you've got meta-analyses that not only look at uh, just sort of binary type measures, but you, you have dose-response meta-analyses showing that higher plant intakes show better outcomes than lower plant intakes. And you've got studies looking at these hard endpoints, like like disease endpoints. Um, and you, you have meta-analyses looking at well, the ultimate endpoint, mortality. And then on the uh, on the other end, you have meta-analyses looking at intermediate endpoints like blood markers of disease, um, uh, various smaller indicators of what might result in disease, all of this stuff collectively from the collectively. immediate outcomes like to, the, so to the hard much. endpoint. All of it converges upon the conclusion that higher plant intakes – lead to more favorable clinical markers and, and intermediate endpoints of disease as well as these hard endpoints of disease and actual mortality itself. All of it favors doesn't, higher plant. Doesn't health, healthy, healthy user bias. Oh, yeah, but, but it's healthy user bias. Let's just healthy, write all healthy of it user bias. The only, the only subjects they found for all of these thousands of studies in, encompassing tens of thousands of people were all healthy people. So, like, they just they sent out a memo and said, hey, we're looking for subjects who are really freaking healthy. So that way we can just use <laughs> across these multiple continents and countries. Because in a few years, there's going to be this diet that comes out. And there's this guy that's <laughs> going to need. I mean, I don't know. what Like, even from for everything, and I'm the meathead on the show, and that's fine. But everything from a base level, common sense knowledge, eat your fruits and vegetables, Something your mama told you when you was little, right? Like, be healthy, eat your fruits and vegetables. But science tells us in every study we look at, fruits and vegetables, okay, animals have defenses and take, animals have defenses and taste good. They don't want to be eaten. Plants have different defense, defenses and also taste good. That's correct. So, like, that was the thing we wanted to hit on was, um, you hit on it in your, in your research review, which anybody watching this, make sure to go out and subscribe to that as well. Support our bro him. 
Um, and Alan hit on that. This thing, again, it's, it's not a case where I'm trying to beat up and we're all getting up. And we just came to the same conclusion. And one of them was talking about phytonutrients. And you, you kind of, you touched on that, Alan, is like the whole, the, the point of phytonutrients is that, uh, it's, it's the chemicals that plants produce to, to protect themselves that are considered slightly toxic to us. And people will go, well, that doesn't sound good. Actually, no, it's the, it's the other way around. Um, where people get mixed up with that is, um, these, the toxins in, in, that are, that are considered phytonutrients, um, are kind of like acute stressors. And they basically function for us as humans when we eat them. They're, they're, one of their main functions is that because they're an acute stressor, it's a type of hormesis. And when people don't understand what that means, it's like a positive stressor that has a positive outcome for us. When you weight train, weight training effectively is a type of hormesis. So like the response is that we grow larger, we grow stronger. Um, there's all these benefits that we know there is to resistance training. Well, the same can be said with phytonutrients. So these toxins that he talks about, it was so weird to me that Lane wasn't able to just smash that because I'm like, dude, it's phytonutrients. Like, every, like you, for the people who don't know what phytonutrients are, they're just toxins in plants um, that that aren't necessarily harmful to us. They can be depending on like when we come back to the individual thing. But for the most part, they help to strengthen our immune system. Um, they have a multitude of uh, of, of benefits that you're only going to get. From plants, from yeah. eating plant foods. Yeah, you, you know, you can look at population data, and the population data unanimously points to the longest living and healthiest populations having a predominance of plant intake in their diets. Now, obviously, with observational Health, healthy research, po- health, healthy subject population bias, Alan. Oh yeah, can't use right, those. Right, you can't right, use right. those. Right, right. Healthy user bias. Healthy right? user bias. You can't write it use all those. off. You can't use those. So, right, but actually, let me I use this time. Right? Let me just study with eight people who have diverticulitis or diverticulosis <laughs> and and help you understand why they like fiber and uh, phytonutrients are exceptionally harmful. I'm just. I don't want to get. Go ahead. Or, yeah. Or, I don't or, or just. Or just take a Twitter poll. A, a Twitter poll, poll because that's exactly the same as double blinded peer reviewed. Research and then in large know, scale made analysis. That's right, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so observational research, almost everybody. No, it, look where where there's smoke, there is sometimes fire, and almost everybody knows that the longest living populations on the planet have a predominance of plant intake. So that is an observation. It's not the product of controlled intervention where we can see cause and effect. It's an observation, a correlation, right? So now it could be possible that these populations have other factors in their lifestyle that contribute to longevity, that contribute to the lowering of their disease incidence and prevalence. Uh, There could be social factors going on there. Um, There could be other lifestyle factors going on like physical activity, Um, there, there, there's a number of factors swirling around with these populations that contribute to their longevity, right? But coincidentally, they just eat a lot of fruit, like fruits and vegetables. Coincidentally, right? And, and coincidentally, that plant intake is not messing these people up. You know that what are the, you know what's going on here? And so we have to look at experimental research to see what could possibly be the mechanisms behind fruit and vegetable intake that could be contributing to longevity so we can look at meat cause and effect now here's the thing just sort of as a general research methods concept for for the listener here you can't really look at disease outcomes and uh and and things like mortality you can't really look at that stuff feasibly with randomized controlled trials because randomized controlled trials, you have to control everything, and that's freaking expensive, and it's tough to do for long periods of time. And it's just not feasible most of the time to run randomized controlled trials for freaking years and decades. Mm-hmm. So then we have to rely on population research to keep an eye on what's going on with these folks. And so – and and you know, not to go off on too much of a rabbit hole here, but with observational research, there's 
more there's there's stronger observational research and weaker observational research so the stronger observational research is looked at prospectively so you follow a group over time in in a forward direction of the timeline versus looking at a group and looking retrospectively what they might have done so anyways prospective observational data all of it prospective retrospective it all shows positive stuff of, uh, of plant intake in a dose response manner. So now we go, okay, well that is observational data and it doesn't show cause and effect. So let's look at experimental data. So experimental data shows mechanistically that it may be certain compounds in plants that could contribute to positive effects in health. And, um, a couple of them, well, one of them is the polyphenol content and, you know, there's debates that can go on, you know, about polyphenols and their their uh, their biological relevance and whether they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing or not. But um, the other thing would be fiber. So um, wait, if you fiber. Look, I heard that's bad for me. It's so bad for you, man. Uh, <laughs> if I, you know, instead of instead of eating hemlock, what they did was they fed Socrates uh, fiber, just a cup of fiber, right. man. He died in like in like thirty minutes. Fiber. He'd been he'd been eating uh, all that meat. And as soon as somebody gave him some fiber, came down with diverti- a combination of diverticulitis and diverticulosis. Osis, right? Yeah, yeah, both, yeah, both of them at the same time because the, <laughs> that damn fiber uh, intake, which is which is clearly detrimental to your health as well. And that's another thing with with that. You can paint all of the theoretical hypothetical scenarios you want about the detriment of fiber but then you have to ask what does the evidence say about fiber intake and what we know about the evidence of fiber intake as it stands today from multiple meta-analyses is that fiber contributes positively to cardiovascular health and other parameters of, of health as well so once again it, you'd be hard pressed to look at the weight of the evidence and try to find needles in the haystacks showing detrimental effects of fiber intake. Um, and sure, like what, what Paul Saladino did was he found these isolated incidents and he cherry picked uh, various l- little bits of research that show potential concern, right? But then again, all right, let's kind of pan back. And if fiber was such a bad thing, wouldn't vegetarians and vegans be just keeling over? They, just- they would. It, it, Clearly, there's there's a, a problem. There can be there can be a problem with vegetarian diets and, and certain um, micronutrient deficiencies. That that's pretty well known because the people who are very uh, devout vegetarians or vegans um, that do well from a health standpoint know how to supplement their diet in a way that, that makes up for the, for potential micronutrient deficiencies. But the thing is, nobody would be if there was if if it was really this bad, Alan. Nobody would be able to sustain a vegetarian diet for any length of time without suffering significant physiological problems, health problems, a deterioration, you know, uh, of, of health over. Like it just wouldn't even be like you would have physicians everywhere saying, look, just stay away from vegetarian diets. They'll literally just kill you like real, like in like a year. You're just going to be dying. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, there's plenty of bodybuilders that are even vegetarians and can grow muscle, you know, if they supplement their diet, especially, you know, making sure to, to, to supplement uh, adequately with, say, leucine. But basically, overall, vegetarians who do an intelligent uh, vegetarian approach to dieting are re- relatively very healthy. Right. Right. Agreed. Agreed. And it's not it's not even really debatable, man. Um, I like to think of the carnivore diet as being the other, the opposite end of the spectrum from just strict militant veganism. It's, it's literally, it's exactly, no, that's not, that's not what you, just what you think. That's exactly what it is. If, if you, as much as people want to make fun, it's really kind of a weird social uh, construct, right? Because people Bingo. totally make fun of vegans, but literally the most knee-jerk reaction to a vegan, which is the opposite, is literally eating meat, and like nothing else outside of me, but then people like sit back and applaud that for some reason. And I don't understand. Both are very extreme decisions to be making. Um, and I think where you were going with that, where we both want to, what we we're going to hit on was that I think both of those type of stances have as much to do with tribal community, social ideology as they do with anything that's really health related. That's my perception 
it's not that the people who kind of at the forefront of, of promoting these diets, it's, they, they do a good job of finding kind of like the benefits of the diet. And it's, what I don't like is when somebody that's promoting a diet, whether it's carnivore meat or what, vegan or whatever, uh, it could be keto, could be any of the named diets, be upfront about the shortcomings of the diet. That helps everyone. What they don't want to do that, they don't necessarily want to talk about that there's, yeah, there's going to be shortcomings. Any type of elimination diet will absolutely have shortcomings from a micronutrient standpoint, potentially from a macronutrient standpoint, depending on which one you're looking at and depending on what your goals are, right? Depending on what your goals are. Like I wouldn't, if you're trying to get as big as possible and become a mass monster, I'm not going to tell you to pick a keto or carnivore diet. Like that's kind of counterintuitive um, to your goals. So... I Guys, but can the, you hear me now? I turned my video off. Yeah, off. totally. Okay. okay, good. I don't want to interrupt. But I just want to see if I could chime in at all. Keep yeah, going. no, I, yeah, yeah, that's great. We got so you. I was going to say, I would just to cheer back because I think that was kind of the third facet I wanted to hit on with this, but it, it's a little different. Uh, I, I think we've kind of hit on it before, but I think it's a commonality that you see across dieting in particular, and even with training styles, because I've seen it over the years, is that people gravitate towards particular ideologies, and part of that is how we're built um, uh, internally and kind of that need for connection, for community, uh, for identification, meaning it's not enough to have uh, one of the, the, the psychological needs that we have is, is that drives us um, is the need for something that gives us deep meaning in our life. But it's not enough if you delve further into that. It's not enough to actually have something that gives you deep meaning in your life. It's very important and it's vital to you from a basically a psychology standpoint, from a psychology needs standpoint, to have community that you connect with that shares those similar values and goals. Now, we, we see that across every part of society. So when somebody does something like a carnivore and they get super into it, I absolutely know watching from the outside that's not really just about dieting. It really is about that need to connect, have community, have that tribal um, that in their life. That is that's a huge part of how we're built um, from from a social standpoint. Um, we're we're social creatures. We're pair bonding creatures. Uh, that's why people, you know, dating apps or just dating in general, such as relationships, are a huge part um, of who we are. But so is community. And I think that gets tossed out a lot of times by the people who are purely research based and they're just looking at the benefits or the drawbacks of the diet and they completely strip away the human condition part of all of that and miss the fact that a lot of this like is a training style. Like, well, I train, I choose this one particular training style, bro, because it's awesome. That's how I train. And then in a particular diet, well, I, I do a paleo diet. It's cool. Like people, when paleo first came out, it was cross and paleo was like intertwined very significantly. And a part of that is community, is bonding, and that gives you the sense that, hey, this mission that I'm on, this thing that I do that gives me deep meaning in my life, there's other people that have that same thing. They have that same vision. They have that same goal and whatever. And we go and we meet at CrossFit and we do a bunch of shitty-ass chin-ups and fuck ourselves up. And then we go home and, <laughs> and then we go home and, and then we go home and we, we pound down, you know, like uh, because we can have our tubers at that time. But the rest of the time, just eating paleo cookies. And then. And, and then, like, you know, it's like the keto people, you know, like, you know, it's like the jokes he's gotten bad now. People show up and, you know, like when you're at a restaurant and somebody's like, uh, you know, are you going to get dessert? No, I'm keto. And then, like, the, the, the vegetarian across to them goes, well, that's, a, you know, they can still like, wow, you're keto. Wow, you're eating, so you're eating like animal meat all day. So, like, there's, <laughs> but those people have communities. So, if you're, well, the thing about the internet now is, and social media is like if you're keto or you're carnivore or you're paleo, um, whatever it is, like all of these different little ideologies that kind of that kind of resonate with who we are. We want community with those two. We absolutely do. We want people to connect with that we can identify with that we can share part of like what interest like our interest in that. Like Scott and I made this joke about that guy making the thing on Twitter about the guy, what's his name, Paul Saladino or whatever. Like he ran a poll on Twitter and a bunch of pretty much everybody that chimed in said that carnivore was more satiating than a keto diet. And Scott and I both laughed, and I said, dude, I swear it's weird. When I go to a Kansas City Chiefs game, there's Chiefs fans everywhere. It's so weird. So if I go out to the carnivore diet guy's Twitter page, I'm gonna, it's so weird that I'm going to find a bunch of people that are going to be agreeing that his diet is better than basically all these other diets because that is part of community building. And a lot of people make fun of that, but they don't understand 
the psychological human condition need behind all of those factors. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to toss something in. Can you hear me here? Because I know sort of a finishing from what you I want to pull away from she connected to what she just said, Paul. Can you guys hear me okay? I turned the video off. Am, am I feeding uh, Yeah, it's a little better. Normally? Okay, good. A little good. better. So, the interesting thing here, and I'm sort of piecing this together, is if we – and we may have touched on this at least um, – kind of come at it from the side is that humans, um, we, we are, we are a very diverse species. We're all, we're scattered across the globe. And part of that is our, our versatility and our diets are highly variable. Our cultures are highly variable. And if you think about how we would find food, there's that sort of a, this is what I, when I, I in that and. Ah. And different different cultures will different ways to. Scott, you're cutting out, my man. Scott, and he's making such a great point. Uh, oh, uh, oh, it's killing me. I know where he's going with this. Like, a, like, like, I don't want to paraphrase for Scott. No, that's a little better. My phone up. Okay, I'm going to hold. I'm holding my phone up now, literally to to maybe get a better better. That signal. actually so, literally helps. Uh, that helps. Okay, good. Uh, um, <laughs> on that, so. It's all good. I'm like, I got the Statue of Liberty pose going on here. So, so then we have uh, plants, of course, that mount different defenses. It, we, is the background noise now? A little bit, but it's, it's all right. Bit. It's all right. Okay. So we have plants that mount these different defenses, um, and we figure out ways of cooking them, soaking beans, doing various things to be able to make use of that food across cultures in various different ways. And, of course, one of the key things that, that allows Darwinian evolution and um, the, the forces that, that drive that to work is having variability among the species. Some people are going to have tolerance to others. You got swallowed up, brother. You got swallowed up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I think Turn that made the the point i didn't be, no no, no. Also, I, I i yeah i wish you could i wish you'd have been clear on that because that was such a great point i think what you're getting back to is is, is saying the same thing different. It's, it's almost going for you go back thousands and thousands of years and such a huge part of community that we had then that we really don't have as much now was was if you were in a particular community or group or tribe or whatever it's like a huge part of your daily life was the get, gathering together to hunt uh, to forage, uh, to, to, to cook your food a specific way. All of this had deep meaning. All of this had deep meaning. Um, if you grew up in a family where everybody got together on Sunday, right, and everybody brought food over um, and ate together, those kind of things, uh, that collaboration, uh, it, it's, it's a huge part of what we need functionally to function healthy from a social standpoint. And I think a huge part of what we see with with this is, is nothing new. I mean, it's, it's something that we do with everything. Even, like I said, even with the training style, or going to gyms, or you know, picking a, a particular diet, or whether it's whether your spiritual beliefs, the, the, all these things gra- help us gravitate. They help create meaning in our life, and then we want to attach ourselves to other people who share those sentiments and those those same kind of things. They find deep meaning in themselves. That strengthens us and how we feel about that particular journey. And you know, I, I wanted to mention this about the, the whole carnivore thing and the social aspect of it. Um, it would be interesting. It would be an interesting study to see what the demographic and what the psychographic is of people who hop on carnivore. So in my opinion, it's kind of a first world diet type of an <sighs> endeavor. Okay, and so uh, what I mean by that is, and and even before that, if you look at a lot of the carnivore folks, in my personal observations, a lot of them used to be vegans, and they feel burned by veganism because on their vegan diet, they're consuming a bunch of refined flour foods because it was vegan, and a bunch of essentially highly ultra processed refined foods that were vegan friendly and they're holding on to a bunch of body weight and potentially um, because of the the composition of their crappy vegan diets also were carrying a bunch of disease burden so 
um, I think there's almost this reactionary shift to being burned by veganism and having that kind of e extreme sort of cognitive uh, framework where where people can really only think in black and white terms. Okay, I got burned by veganism. I'm going to go all the way to the other side and do carnivore now. So I th in my observations, a lot of people who do either carnivore or veganism have done both, and they're – they're not set up to have long-term uh, success in either one just because of their mindset. Yeah, so. because it's reactionary and emotionally based, Alan. Yep. It's reactionary and it's emotionally based. Um, whereas if somebody sat down and they actually looked across the board um, at all the various different kind of styles, and I hate that we have to say styles of, say, I don't know if like when I think of the word diet, I think of like getting shredded. But the point is, is that you're kind of your nutritional lifestyle is that if you you set down with all of the different factors involved in different nutritional lifestyles. Um, and I made this post before was that it's pretty difficult to go wrong with uh, getting an adequate amount of protein in each day, making sure that you're getting your essential fatty acids in each day. Um, and eating your fruits and vegetables and looking at kind of carbohydrates as a fast fuel source um, that should be kind of used in conjunction with your daily activities. Um, that's just kind of how an overarching point of view that I, I when people ask me, like if you can approach a diet that way and you can eat all your protein, uh, eat your fruits and vegetables, get your essential fatty acids in, uh, have uh, intelligent carbohydrate management, I guess that's the way I would I would say, in other words, if you're a sloth um, and you work a highly sedentary job uh, and you're, you know, you don't do very much, you don't work out or whatever, you probably don't need to eat a mega shit ton of carbohydrates every day. But if you want to, just make sure caloric balance is taken care of. But either way, either way, getting back to manipulating a diet, the high high level overview. If you want your, to put your health and wellness first, make sure that you're eating uh, all your foods. Uh, there are the majority of your foods from whole food sources, uh, minimizing overly processed, uh, hyper palatable foods that are, are very energy dense, but uh, very, very nutrient absent of, of, of a high degree of, of micronutrients. Um, it's tough to go wrong with just kind of looking at it that way. And I think with these very extreme style of um, elimination diets like that, as like you said, I think people set themselves up because here's the thing. Uh, if you eat an all meat only diet, which has never been observed really throughout any, um, well, how would you say it? any any type of anywhere geographically in the world over the history of mankind, well, what's that going to look like in five years? If you were to actually to sustain that for five years, um, yeah, like we see a lot of vegan, like I said, a, a really intelligent person doing a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, they still have to be intelligent enough to know to cover their micronutrients to make that work for them long term. Yeah. And I would so be very, is, very skeptical to, to know. Uh, it seems to me that such a small segment of the people who try strict carnivore actually stay on it long term. And the people who will be the most vociferous about this and just be the squeaky wheels about it are the people with very extreme kind of mindsets who are able to do strict carnivore for years on end. You know, that such a small percentage of the population would be able to do that because a, lo a large percentage of them would, in, in essence, eventually kind of snap back to their senses, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah, and I, you know, like I said, I, I think, you, like you said, eventually, um, I think like we're both saying, eventually, it's such an extreme method of dieting. There, clearly, there'll be some outliers who can sustain it for a long period of time. Um, but also the belief that you can get all, you can cover all of your, your micronutrient bases by simply eating an animal head to tail is absolutely in every way incorrect. Yep. Like yeah. there's, I don't know why that statement is being perpetuated because it's absolutely incorrect. Especially if you only stick to, let's say, beef. There, there's an enamorment with beef among on the, the on the, among the carnivore people. Absolutely, where they just eat beef all day. And I'm That's like, it. I don't understand that. Like how, like even from a common sense standpoint, it's like, well, we, none of, of 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 our ancestors, like I said, spanning the globe, they ate whatever it is they could find that basically was 
edible. I don't know any other way to rephrase that, but the point is they were eating uh, plants, they were eating fruits, they were eating fruits and vegetables, and they ate protein whenever they could come by it. So, um, and most people these days don't eat organ meats either. Um, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever met a single person in my life that said, "Man, I love liver." I just like you know, it's, I, I get there's probably some people, but most people don't eat organ meats either. And those are the ones that actually tend, if you want to get into the uh, the meats that had the, the there were most nutrient dense, those are the ones that nobody eats those. Yeah. I, I personally love liver, but I gotta have it you with love onions. liver. So I gotta have it with onions, sautéed onions, man. That is, <laughs> I'm oh. sure. Ah, oh, I dude, I, my mom could make good liver and onions. So yeah, with with liver and onions, I think it's because the onions cover up what the liver tastes like. <laughs> yeah. No, All I, I right. Love my all right, so I think like, I think, like, I think so, we killed it, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me just cover yeah. like, the high level overview. I think, like I said, anybody watching this goes. So, what's my takeaway? Uh, takeaway from red meat. There's nothing really special about red meat. Are we in unison on that? Yes, it's just like a, any any other food, really. Just any other like like I think the one thing that we did head on because guys, like I said, we try to be fair. If you're in, if you're dieting extremely hard. It could be a possible option to use late at night for your last meal to help with uh, satiation sleep. Um, and if you're eating a very, very low fat during that time, it could help to give you a little boost hormonally. Um, so that's that's one area that we saw that they, I mean, that could also be done by supplementing um, with with fatty fish, in my opinion, which would probably be a better option overall. That's just my opinion because you're getting a better intake of omega threes. So um, nothing exceptionally special. In fact, the one thing I wanted to add there is if I were to pick one single food, I think that's like your best protein source overall for lifters, it's salmon. I think it's difficult to go wrong with salmon. Yeah. If you were to really narrow it down and you were backed up against a wall, I would choose fatty fish over steak. Every time, every single time. I, I, for me, it's not even close. If you're actually going to look at the research – from a health and wellness standpoint, and I know that some of the data came out a while back that showed that uh, uh, supplementing with omega threes either di- they did not help increase muscle protein th- synthesis, uh, but like Scott said, there's some I think there's some anecdotal evidence there when guys have really pounded the shit out of fish oil or go to eating more fatty fish. There's kind of something that does happen. Uh, with your body composition, but that could even be related to inflammation because we know very well that omega threes have a direct impact on reducing uh, inflammation. So it's hard to say. Yeah. There's, there's so many things, right? Scott, would you agree what with that? If you reduce inflammation, your insulin sensitivity would also improve as well. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that can happen. The, the thought that I wasn't able to express or get out was was that was that um, the one that was well there was one of the many but arachidonic acid may also be playing a role here in shifting from red meat some people it's a funny thing that's a whole other topic but um that is being sold of course as a supplement that because arachidonic acid is a pro-inflammatory fatty acid um and i've talked to people who have started supplementing with that and just been just sore as all get out like literally Mm. debilitatingly sore unable to continue to train they would have otherwise and then there are some people, of course, there's high variability in muscle soreness, which suggests that you know, there's something going on, a large range in what's going on in terms of post-exercise inflammation related to muscle soreness and damage um, that's involved here. So we've got anti-inflammatory uh, omega-3, omega-3 fatty acids, pro-inflammatory uh, rachidonic acid, and if you're swapping those out, somebody could be sort of shifting, speaking of hormesis, into a – a zone of inflammation mm-hmm. and thus muscle remodeling post exercise that's more optimal for them for for getting muscle growth. So, you know that's that's a scenario where just that's we're not talking about um, chicken to, to red meat. We're talking about here to salmon, for instance, and that would be actually closer macro wise as well. So, totally. yeah, there's all sorts of things that that can sort of confound, you know, anecdotal um, evidence that people you know report back. Yeah, um, you know, obviously a pretty complicated picture. Yeah, yeah so I think personally, I'm, if I could, side. if I could choose, I would do both, man. I would go surf and turf all day. You know, yeah. that that's me. I, yeah. I love them both. I think I think they both have their uh, both have their benefits. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to point out that I forgot about pointing out about the, the carnivore diet is the reduction in food variety also helps people eat less overall. And that's yeah. kind of a, uh, Scott you know, that's brought a, that up last podcast. We talked about keto. He's like, once you, once you take one of the macronutrients out, it becomes a little bit easier to kind of manage your caloric intake overall. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the default benefits. But then when people start putting the diet up on a pedestal and then start making things up about the detrimental effects of plant foods. Yeah. That's when, you know, you start running into problems. So. Yeah. And I, I think that would be the, the case. It's like, like a, they're boarding you now. It's both. Okay. Finish strong. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah, finish. So. Be, be safe on your trip, brother. Yeah, man. Travel well, safe, Scott. Well, Take you care. Guys. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So, yeah. So Scott's out. That was that's that was an, it's been an interesting uh, Swole Trinity call, but like wrapping up uh, and like I said, I, I wanted to like you had already hit on these really well, Alan. So I wanted to kind of allow. I guess it worked out that way, right? Because if we were to if there would have been a topic where we needed Scott to talk a lot, that was this would have been a total shit show. So, um, <laughs> and I think overall what we're saying is um, if you like beef, eat beef. Um, there, there's no magical properties. Uh, over that of other animal protein sources. And with the carnivore diet comes back to the takeaway from everybody listening is if you have digestion uh, issues um, or gut problems uh, that they're not aware of uh, that, that are related to inflammation or a microbiota or whatever, that going to something like the carnivore for say weeks or, or even maybe a few months to figure out what it is that's giving them problems. It could be a huge, huge benefit uh, from in that way. Um, I, I don't necessarily, I don't really ever have a particular problem with people eating a certain way. I know you, you adhere to that same thing, even though sometimes people think you're, um, you either don't like a particular eating style. I think both of us have the same problem with certain things, and that is um, don't present something in a way that's not entirely accurate. And I yeah. think the big problem I have with, with the carnivores, not the carnivore diet, I see plenty of benefits like I can with, with pretty much most things, dissecting the benefits. But um, don't try to sell me on the ideology that fruits and vegetables um, are bad for us. And that, right. that like if we took out fruits and vegetables, like for, you know, vegetables are to- you know toxic. We understand there's toxins in certain vegetables that's eaten, but they actually serve, as I said, as an acute stressor, which is a positive force for our immune system, um, for digestive health in other ways. Um, so there's a there's to try to sell me on the fact that fruits and vegetables are bad for me. I'm just not going to I'm not going to believe that. All right. As far as the superhuman aspects of beef putting on muscle for every two <laughs> for every two point two pounds of beef you eat, you'll get five grams of creatine. And if you eat two point two pounds of chicken, you're going to get. Similar five, five, right around five grams of creatine. So yeah, that was the other thing is the the whole creatine because that one gets tossed out a lot, right? Like you probably hear that one all the time yourself. But like, but red meat's got a bunch of creatine in it. I'm like, no, dude, it's just pretty much the same across yeah. uh, and like as far as animal proteins go, not including fish. Um, so I think that uh, I think that we covered everything. Yeah, and if we didn't, guys, hit us up. Um, we would love to, in future segments, just go over some some burning questions that we haven't quite uh, put through the crucible. And and apologize to anybody that watched this that um, didn't get to hear Scott or Fallon showed up blurry. I'm not sure how it all worked. We had a, we had a minor tef- technical difficulties today. Um, so if, if that if that was the case, but a lot of people they actually say they listen, they just like put the podcast in and listen. So I don't know the one, but anybody wants to necessarily see our ugly faces anyway. So yeah. I think it's, it's yeah, more it's about a little scary at certain points. Yeah, disseminating the information. So uh, for for our own Broham, who's now on the plane, Scott Stevenson, um, and Alan, thank you for being with me today, man. Thanks, I, man. I, I absolutely appreciate believe that you crush it. So you know, I always appreciate you. Uh, that is the uh, that's the wrap on Swoley Trinity Podcast 03. Thank you, everybody. Peace out, guys. <laughs>